Welcome to Legacy Therapy, the podcast that will teach you, in bite-sized chunks, how to leave a stress-free legacy so loved ones can focus on people, not paperwork, when you become ill or pass away. Here is your host and financial advocate, Stacy golden Lisnock. Hello and welcome to the edition of Legacy Therapy, Planning Techniques for a Stress-Free Legacy. And I'm your host, Stacey golden Lisnock, Financial Advocate. And today I have with me Megan Bazzuto. And Megan has a real life story that I thought would be really interesting to share uh, because from her perspective, it really happened to her and we can learn a lot from, from it. And so kind of want to don't want to talk too much, let, let Megan get started and sort of tell her story of what happened. I think it was, was it just last year? Yep. It was March of 2019. Um, my husband was on a business trip and was scheduled to be traveling home that day and called me in the morning. Something didn't seem right, but I, it kind of raised suspicion, but not enough suspicion for me to do anything. And then I couldn't get a hold of him for a couple of hours and he eventually called me back. And at that point I knew something was very wrong. He couldn't speak and his, he could speak, but he was slurred. He didn't, he wasn't making any sense. He had somehow managed to get from the hotel room he was in to the airport thinking he would just get home and then figure out what was going on. Thankfully he didn't get on that plane and I was able to get kind of guide him to give his phone to somebody else so that we could get him medical help. Um, and from there he was transported to a hospital. They, I didn't hear from him for a few hours. I was trying to call the hospital. I finally got, I finally got a picture from my husband. He took a selfie in the hospital bed, which is, if you know, my husband, he doesn't do selfies. So <laughs> it was very strange, but I said, okay, he yeah. has his phone. Yeah. I'm going to call him. And he answered and then just handed the phone to the doctor. And at that point, they let me know they were going in to, to figure out what was going on, but he had been assessed for a stroke and they, they thought he was having a stroke, Wow. Um, which he, and I, I mean, I, I think when, when I hear stroke, I tend to think kind of older, unhealthy people. Um, he was 41 years old. He was seeing a doctor regularly. He was out for a run that morning. He was taking care of himself. There were no, he didn't have any of the underlying risk factors that would make you think stroke risk. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Does it, and anything in his family history? There's, there's some history of heart issues in his family, but nothing, nothing stroke related. Yeah. Like he hadn't exhibited anything or any reason. No. So, and so he was, he was out of the state Yes. And then you, and then you had to, you had to fly. Yeah. So thankfully, and, and this is Stacy, I think one of those things that the importance of kind of having a plan, even if you think, so I laugh because the, the Christmas before we had gone to a family holiday party, it was an ugly sweater party and we bought matching sweaters that said hashtag blessed. And we've always kind of said, you know, we, we live a very fortunate life. We don't have to plan anything like nothing's, nothing's ever happened. Nothing's ever going to happen. And, um, and so then you're in it and, and I, I, I panic, right. Who do I call? So my sister-in-law lives nearby and we had been texting and I texted her when I was on the phone with him and I said, something's very wrong. I need help. And she lives about 30 minutes away. She dropped everything. She came with her husband. They took my kids and cause I have three small kids too. And that's, that's where the planning becomes important because I can't just hop on an airplane and leave my three elementary children home. Right. And I don't have family. I don't have a lot of family really close. So they came, they took the kids. I somehow managed to get from my house. I live near Boston to the airport and on a flight within like an hour and a half, I was in Las Vegas that night. Um, and by the time I landed, he was in the neuro ICU and was awake. He was alert, but he was not able to communicate. He could, he could say words, but he, he knew who I was. He couldn't say my name. Um, he had what they called aphasia, which is not, it's, it's not, not anything that affects your brain in terms of your intelligence. It affects the ability to actually speak. Um, and then there were cognitive issues on top of that as well, related to kind of making the right judgment calls and decisions. 
Um, so I, I walked into the neuro ICU completely unprepared for what is it? Like I had gotten some messages while I was in transit, but I still didn't really know, like, what, what am I walking into? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I somehow (laughs) really strangely, one of our very good family friends was in Las Vegas on a business trip as well. And I managed to connect to him. So he came to the hospital so that I wasn't alone. Um, my mother-in-law flew in later that day because you're suddenly presented with, I don't even know. I, I mean, I didn't even know where to start, right? Who do I call from his company? Who do I let know that, that this has happened? Who, what are the benefits? How, how do we get home? We're in Las Vegas. We live in Boston. How, how there was so much to navigate and not having kind of, we've, we've never really talked about what, what would we do? Right. And, um, and then after a couple of days, it struck me, Hey, you know, he pays all of our bills <laughs> and I, is our mortgage, does it pay automatically? I'm assuming he pays everything automatically, but I don't know if our mortgage is going to be paid. I don't know when it's supposed to be paid. So then I'm trying to get in. I, it's access to the accounts, right? So I'm trying to get into the bank account because then I could look and see the history and see if it's been paid out in the past, what other bills are coming due. Um, and realize that I didn't have the access. So I had to get his laptop and figure out the passwords and find his documents. And again, it's all of this. I mean, looking back, I would, it was like, we could have been better planned, right? There's, there's a lot that we could have done leading up to that point to have a better plan of, I mean, shame on me for not knowing how to access the bank information. (laughs) Um, I've just always relied on him for that. And you don't think that, that these things are going to happen to you, right? You don't, you, it, it's hard to talk about, Hey, someday you may just end up in the hospital and not be able to talk. Let's talk through what's the plan. Right. Um, they're difficult conversations to have. We had had a conversation because he traveled a lot. We had started working through setting up a will, which we never finished, right? We, we had gotten it initiated, but never went back and actually signed the documents. Um, but it's, they're difficult conversations. And now I feel like they're even more difficult because we've been through it. And so I look at it as this is really, really important, but I think it's also questioning mortality and what is it we're planning for? You don't want to assume the worst, but then again, we still have three small kids. We still own a big house. I still need to know what to do if, if something were to happen. And on the flip side, I now look at it. If something was to happen to me, Because so thank, thankfully my husband has recovered tremendously, right? He's back at work. He's, he's able to walk. I, the, the thing I omitted before when I landed in Las Vegas, he also had no use of the right side of his body. Um, The stroke had impacted the left side of his brain. So he couldn't move his right leg. He couldn't move his right arm. Mm -hmm. So the doctor said, just, you just, just pray he'll someday walk again, because if you can't walk, you can't drive, you can't, there's a lot that, that you lose. Um, so he's recovered the ability to walk. He's still not able to use his right arm and he still, he still suffers from fatigue. There's some memory issues. So then I say, if something happens to me, what happens at home? Right. Because to him, just to, <laughs> if, I always laugh that if something happened to him, the kids would be fine, right? I can handle the three kids, but can he do the same? Would it, would he be able to, to handle the three kids in the house and working and everything? And so having, having some sort of plan for, even if it's me, that something happens to, what are the steps we follow? Yeah. Pretty, pretty eye opening, huh? Yep. And yeah. so, yeah, you've been there and you've seen, and you've kind of been in the trenches and got yourself out of it, but But now, I mean, it's not that it's not like it couldn't happen again. Something else, you know, and at some point something will happen down the road, but um, we all have that. But I I just find it very odd that in society, even though it's something that's a for sure, you know, um, it's kind of like I was thinking you come in the come into the world kicking and screaming. Right. And you go out just like exhausted and just laid out uh, done. You just you just spent and so there's, there's that cycle. It's a life cycle and it's so, I mean, it's universal. And so I'm, un, I'm just still perplexed at how come that society hasn't made it more of a thing that people just do like you do your taxes and everything else, because 
wouldn't the world just be so much less stressful if if you already if everybody knew what was going to happen if something happened to one or the other um you know and where, where your kids would go and right and care I, of your pets and it's it's also the I think I look at it from the the mindset of if something were to happen to me right and it was tragic and I never came back to my house what I don't want to leave them with a mess I don't want to leave them having to sort through paperwork and find out like where, where is all the information to me? If you're grieving, if you're going through challenges, if you're, I mean, I was, I was making medical decisions for him in Las Vegas. And it's like, I don't want to have to think about where everything else is. It's there's, you already have so much stress on top of you. So if you can take that element out and I know nobody wants to plan for terrible things to happen, right? It's Mm -hmm. hard to say, Someday we know this is going to happen. So it's important that we do it. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to have that conversation. It sucks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's not, but I also think if you look at it from the perspective of your, it's your legacy, you're leaving behind something that is not going to add to the overwhelm. It's not going to, they're not going to spend hours navigating your information, which I think just adds to the grief, right? It's, it's harder to move on if you're stuck having to manage somebody's paperwork or, stuck in long legal battles because things weren't clear enough for your kids. Like there's, I don't want that to happen. I want, if something were to happen to me, I want it to, I want to play a role in what's going to happen with my kids. I want to play a role in the way that I'm going to be remembered. (laughs) And so that's where I think it becomes very important to plan to take that stress off of everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you'd be a perfect poster child for the, for the (laughs) course I created. So when it, when it's the got it together emergency info file, and it's exactly that if something happened, like what happened to your husband, it would happen like that. Like it was not like something that you sort of started feeling um, symptoms of it. I think like my, a cousin of mine got MS and she started having symptoms. So she, she was a server and she started, you know, like not being able to handle the tray and you know, she started having signs and symptoms and was going to the doctor trying to get diagnosed. You know, that's something a little different, even though those people still don't tend to plan um, yeah. because you're always in denial that it's really nothing and it'll go away and tomorrow I'll wake up. and Right. It's not gonna but, be- and I think that's when I look at that, I think, well, you know, if, if, that gives you time to at least have the conversations, right? So even if you don't have the perfect file together, if you know that you're, you're struggling with an illness, like I'll use cancer as an example, if you're diagnosed with cancer. You do, you don't know how big that window is, but you have the opportunity to have those conversations mm-hmm. in my situation. It happened like that, that suddenly my husband went from being fully functioning to not being able to communicate mm-hmm. and it, if it had been worse, right. You, you talk about if he had passed away, I, I never would have gotten some of the information I needed. Um, and, and so I think that in both scenarios, it's great to have a plan because I also think that if there's a diagnosis, if there's something going on, you don't want to be living through that kind of thinking through, well, just in case, (laughs) just in case let's pull, let's ask these questions. Now let's get the information pulled together now. But again, whether you have time to plan or not, they're important conversations to have. Yeah. And, and you know, and the information's out there, but I think um, what I found was that it's, it's just piecemeal, you know, there's no, there's nothing, so which is why I put the course together and it's, it's going, it's going quite well right now. And people that are in the course are so happy to be doing the work because it has been something that's been in the back of their mind. They really know they need to take action, but it's almost like, where do you start? Right. You can buy workbooks. I mean, I've done this, you buy workbooks and then they arrive and you don't actually ever get to them because you have, you you know, you really have to be a special person to be self-motivated to, um, to take it on and, and, and do it. Like I was always a good student. So I was always good at following directions and, and meeting dot the deadline somebody else creates for me. When I create my own deadline, sometimes I just like, I'm real easy on myself and let it go yep. another week and another week until it just dissipates. Like the importance of it just like wanes. It's yep. like, oh, if I've waited this long, you know, I'll just deal with it in the summertime or I'll just deal yeah. with it in the winter time. Or you just kind of make a thing and then it never comes back around. So I really encourage people. This is so important, especially if you have young children, you know, we talk about that, like, where would they go? 
uh, who would be in, responsible for them. And, you know, it's ultimately up to the court, but if yep. you at least make your wishes known, then that gives the court the guidelines to then make their decisions on yep. when, um, when you have pets, like who's going to take care of those pets. If nobody steps up, they end up in the pound. Yep. And, you know, all these medical decisions are so stressful on the people that are being asked for, you know, direction like the doctors are asking what do you want done and if you really don't know you're at a loss then it's just so much stress on you are you making the right decision and you know yeah yeah that happened so we had to make the decision to either stay in las vegas or med flight back to boston Mm -hmm. and i don't know if you've ever experienced having to arrange a medical flight through insurance but it is it's not a fun process because there's, there's timelines you have to wait for the, you have to get the insurance to approve the flight or pay out of pocket, which is expensive. You have to contact the receiving hospital, wait for them to tell you there's a bed. There's then an authorization that gets put in to find the airplane, but they won't book the airplane until they know they have a bed. So I was told that Boston has a bed that they will hold for 48 hours. So now I have to find a plane to get us there. Well, the plane is booked for the next 48 hours. And so then I'm like, no, I want to be at Mass General. I I want to go to that hospital. That's where the doctor is. That's where we need to be. But the people working in the hospital helping with the flights are telling me that that's not possible. And it's like, I'm already stressed. I haven't seen my kids in three weeks. I'm I'm terrified about what's going to happen with my husband. And like to add all that on top of it, it's really stressful. (laughs) Um, and I can look back now and laugh, right. I can look back now and say it all worked out in the end, Right. but living through it. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm an emotional person, but I don't often show my emotions. And I, I completely fell apart in that hospital and it, it's like, there's nothing, there was nothing I could do. And all I wanted to do was get home. But then it's like, okay, well, maybe we just stay in Las Vegas. Maybe we say we'll get a short-term apartment we'll, we'll figure it out here because he was going to need time in rehab, right? He wasn't going home. He was going to need to go to a, a, a rehab facility for possibly four to six to eight weeks. And so my thought was, well, let's get him to Boston. Um, but it's not that easy when somebody can't just get on a flight, <laughs> we had to go med flight and, and, mm. uh, it all worked out in the end, but med flights are, are, an interesting experience. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Wow. So something yeah. you don't want to have to experience. <laughs> no, no. Something so. I had never even thought about before. And yeah. I remember right as we were getting on the plane, I took a photo and I texted it to my sister-in-law and I was like, is this real? Like this, this just, is crazy. This right. is never yeah. would have seen myself in this position ever in my life. Um, yeah. Cause my husband was on a stretcher. He was still on IV meds. He was, he couldn't physically walk. And so he was, he was transported from the ambulance onto the flight and, and then the same in Boston. So it, it was, it was scary. Um, but looking back now, it's like, okay, we survived. We're, we're doing okay. Um, but I think that it speaks to the importance of what you have put together and what you're designing, because I think that there is so much room to plan and prepare and likely you're not talking about months of preparation, right? You're talking about putting together a file. And in the end, that file is going to save you a lot of stress and a lot of time and a lot of headache. So do it now. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And, and the other side of it is for um, families to not be bickering and fighting amongst right. each other. Um, I was talking to a gal and she was telling me that I didn't know this, that some states in their healthcare directives, um, they have like, um, or not healthcare directives, in the lack of having a healthcare directive, some states um, have it so that like, um, it's, it's, a, it's a, a ladder of who gets to make the decision if that one's not available it's the next one the next one and she said if it when it gets to the kids it's not just the youngest or the oldest or some some kid all of the kids have to make the decision and so it could take it can never there can never be a decision if they can't agree yep and i don't know how long people wait in medical emergencies Mm -hmm. for this decision to be made decision yeah (laughs) no and that's i had to give an authorization over the phone 
Mm. So they called me and they wanted to do a procedure, but he couldn't give medical, he couldn't authorize it because he was not communicating. So mm. I had to over the phone completely sight unseen, right? I, right. I had to take the information that I was kind of peering and seeing and, and take their best call and say, yep, go ahead, go ahead. And then because it was verbal, I had to do it twice. They had mm. to give the phone to a nurse and I had to repeat. I, we had to go through the process try, twice to get that, that, Mm, um, approval. Right. Wow. And, um, at the time, I honestly don't even remember what they said to me. I, it just, at that point, I was like, you're the doctor, you know, go do it. I have I, there's nothing else I can do from here. <laughs> so, right. Right. Yeah. That yep. must've been just crazy times. So yep. he's, so he, he did learn to what he had to learn to walk again. And he did. Yep. He was determined. He was so, when they said that he might not walk again, he was like, no, I will, I, I will walk again. Like, and he, he was so determined to walk again. And now if you looked at him, you may not even know that he ever had a stroke, right? I can see it. The people who are close to him can see it. There's mm -hmm. a slight kind of foot drop. There's obviously his arm, his right arm just hangs, but unless you're really looking, he, you can't really tell. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and he is determined. He's still going to PT. He still goes to OT. He's still trying to get his hand to work um, yeah. because that's the thing with, but the, the brain is amazing. I, I'm also, I'm a business person, right? I don't, I don't have medical background, but the brain is amazing and it, you, you can rewire things and there's, there's, there's all sorts of things that go on. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of medical education throughout the process as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is a perfect example of how really the rug can, nothing else matters anymore. You drop everything and you have to attend, att you know, it's, it's, it's just like anything, any emergency in life. If there's a flood, there's a fire, there's an earthquake. It's like, you know, those plans you had on that, that busy schedule that you had just all goes to, to the back burner. Exactly. And yeah. I mean, I actually, I, this happened on a when Wednesday or Thursday, I think it was a Thursday and I had a call scheduled with the CEO of my company the next day for a very important conversation. And I had to text them and say, sorry, not going to be there. I don't know. I don't know when I'm going to be able to have this conversation. And in the end, it, the conversation didn't happen for months. Right. And I was fortunate that I was able to kind of take a step back and manage my right. job with limited hours. And I had a great team to support me. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, nobody, nobody cared what was happening the next day, because in that moment, this is the only thing that matters. Right. Yeah. And I think it's so important too. like, if you are a business owner, like if you have a schedule of appointments or you have people depending on you, that yeah. unless somebody else knows that um, those people are going to just be left hanging. And, you know, for some of them, it could be life and death experience, because if it's an elder person that depends on you to deliver meds or deliver yep. food, or if you're feeding somebody's animal, cause they're away for the week or something, you know, right. it's not going to happen and it's going to be dire consequences for the the poor thing on the other side that didn't, didn't, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So you wonder, they don't talk about that too much. Um, because I don't know that anybody knows like what the cause was of this or that, but, um, you could see how that could easily happen. Right. I mean, even if you had appointments and, and you just didn't show up, it would be like, <laughs> so that, that happened. Yeah. Um, it was either the pediatrician or the dentist and, my kids had appointments that obviously I wasn't even looking at my calendar right. and I got the reminder text that morning and pull a, Oh my God. So I called them and do you know, I don't make excuses, right? If I, if I miss something, I apologize, whatever. So I, I called and I was like, I'm really sorry. My husband had a stroke. He's in the hospital in Las Vegas and the reactions it's like, cause nobody's expecting that, right? Nobody's expecting you to miss an appointment because your husband had a stroke. Right. <laughs> and yeah. so making all those phone calls and then having to go through and be like, okay, what do I have on my calendar the next three weeks? And every time I had to make those phone calls and explain again, what happened, because these are people that I've known for years. Right. And, and you can't just call somebody and say, oh, sorry, I won't be there. My husband had a stroke. They want to know everything. At the time that this happened, we owned two houses and our, we had moved from Connecticut to Boston and our house in Connecticut was rented. We were, we had listed it because the tenants had moved out. We, we wanted to stop renting. It was on the market. And I remember seeing Rich's phone buzz with a text from the realtor saying somebody's really interested. 
And I had completely forgotten that the house was on the market. So I, I had to call her and say, Laura, just get it sold, please. We need to get like, I can't, I don't know what's going to happen, right? This is, we're still just in the hospital. This is what has happened. I don't know the outcome. We need to just sell the house because that's one thing that like, just get it off my plate, please. Um, but again, having to call and, and, and explain this is what has happened and nobody expected it, right? He was healthy. He was young. Yeah. Um, but yeah. it makes for crazy conversations. Yeah. I know um, when you said, when you said it to me, I definitely wanted to have you on the show. I'm like, this is, you know, young, young family with small kids and everything's going beautifully. You know, you, yep. you've mentioned that you've always felt like you had a blessed life because you just, things have been relatively easy. Um, yep. No hardships really, and no illness, yep. and that's such that is a blessing. I always, I always felt that way. For my mom had five kids, and we all were healthy and alive, and we, yep. we stayed out of trouble. For, and and yep. and and then she raised them in many different um, time frames. Because so my sister was born in the forties, my oldest one, and then um, and so three three of them were born in the forties. Yep. And then I was born in the sixties and my other sister was born in the sixties. So she's got oh, kids born big, in the forties yeah, and yeah. kids born in the sixties. Wow. So they were, we were raised totally different in different countries. Even they were in Canada uh-huh. and we were in yeah. California and um, not that California is a country, but <laughs> <laughs> people that live in California think it's a country. They, they do. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I always said that I said, you know, my mom is so fortunate that she's not had to suffer the loss of any, any of her children or anything like that, but yep, yeah. Oh boy. Wow. Well, this has been, I want to say a treat, but it's been definitely an eye opener and um, I'm hoping that it will make people realize that even though you could be the healthiest specimen, I mean, he was running that morning, um, you know, in his early forties, just barely 40 and, um, everything, everything going for him. And, yeah. um, well, and, and we, to, to kind of go back to the stroke thing, we still don't know the cause of it. So that's, what's really scary is because we don't know how the cause I kind of look at it like, well, is it, could it happen again? He's not, I mean, he's, he's seeing a doctor regularly. He's on a lot of medication. So they're, they're preventing as much as possible, but he was young, he was healthy, this completely came out of the blue. And Mm -hmm. we, we, I mean, we were blessed, right? We have three young, healthy children, we life has been pretty easy for us. And, um, and so I think that when you when I first heard what you're doing, I thought I Yeah, that's, that's important. I've, I've been there, right? I've been in need of that resource. And I didn't have it at that point in time. And so I see the importance of it. And I think that it's a great thing that you're doing. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'm, I'm uh, expecting a lot of other people to, to think the same, just based on the results that we're getting so far, because it's, um, yep. it's, it's definitely important work. And, and I think if you're in a group of people going through it at the same time, and you have so, like sounding boards of people that want to have that conversation, <laughs> um, it makes it a little easier. Right. To yeah, tackle. that's a, that's a really important point is the, the having somebody to share in the journey with that may or may not be your own family, but sounding board and being able to share ideas and understand what it, what are the risks? What are the concerns? What are the steps? Like, I think that's, that's always helpful. Yeah. And, you know, you can always learn from other people, um, things that have happened to them that you might think, Oh, I never took that into consideration either. Yep. You know, so it's, it's really valuable. Yeah. Well, agreed. Yeah. Well, I certainly appreciate you coming on and sharing of and course. Um, this has been a pleasure. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah, thank you. And we uh, just like to, I like to always end my show by mentioning to go to the website, www.gotittogethernow.com and and, uh, take a look and see what's on there. And uh, hopefully people will join the course and get this stuff taken care of. So Thanks again, Megan. And thanks, uh, Stacy. You're welcome. So signing off, this is Stacy Golden, Lisnock, your financial advocate. All right. Have a good day and be safe. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Legacy Therapy Podcast. If we hit it out of the park today and you learned at least one new thing to take action on in your own quest to planning the best legacy possible, then be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe and rate and review wherever you get your podcast.
The show notes will provide the sites and information that were discussed today. You can get more great tips, resources, and inspiration by visiting our website, LegacyTherapyPodcast.com.